Welcome back. So we're still, this is gonna be a very protracted part of the course where we're trying to use dynamical equations to describe the time evolution of biological systems. And maybe that's not really that surprising given that biological systems are dynamic. I mean, that's like one of the watchwords of biology is uh, the eternal flux of biological systems. So we're spending quite a few uh, vignettes on this topic and, and I feel, um, feel good about being able to show you all these different vignettes and for you to see different realizations of, of dynamical thinking. And the, the topic of this particular one is uh, about oscillations in biological systems. This will come more in the realm of knowing about than knowing. In other words, we're not going to delve in as deeply into this one as we did into the mutual repression switch. And I already have a, a homework that's, that's put together to, to allow the students to be able to pursue this in a little bit more depth. So at any rate, the first thing I want to say is, uh, as all of us know from our travel schedules uh, back in the days before the pandemic, you know, you, you go to a different time zone and you feel badly, you know, your body is tired and one doesn't go to sleep at the right time and so on. And this is because we have natural clocks and whether you're a cyanobacterium as shown on the upper left with a, a day night cycle, it has to do with photosynthesis or whether you're a human being uh, flying to Europe from Los Angeles, um, you're aware of the fact that we have these very precise clocks and there's much that can be said about this and much that should be said about this. And let me just say that in the context of cyanobacteria, there's, uh, there's some really interesting papers going back to uh, Stan Leibler, and I forgot who his postdoc was, but um, there's a really nice paper in which they removed the, the, the light source and then they, they watched the natural period of the oscillations even after the entrainment due to, to light. What we're going to do is we're going to pursue this question from the standpoint of genetic circuits although there's, there's other examples that could be uh, just as fun. And the three examples that I wanted to show you are uh, shown here. So the top one uh, is that we have an activator which activates itself. It activates a repressor and the repressor represses activator. So as you can see, oh man, this is really, um, I just apologize. I, don't know what to say other than that there's some technical challenges and my computer and iPad lose synchrony and that's very annoying. It's annoying to you and it's more annoying to me. Uh, trust me. So, uh, okay. So here I'm showing you the first of these circuits where um, the activator you can see is, is here. This is the activator gene. And this is the repressor gene. So the, uh, the second one is what's known as the repressilator. And I highly recommend that you go take a look in the literature uh, so you can, you can see how this thing operates. And, um, and that's one that I'll just show you a, a few images of, but we're not going to go into detail. I may well have it as a homework. And the last one is one in which there's a time delay. And I'll comment on that a little bit as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to pursue the, the particular scenario of an activator that activates itself, that activates a repressor, and then the repressor represses the activator. And as is now becoming routine, we're going to achieve this by appealing to states and weights the way that we've been doing thus far and you can see that uh, this is this is for um, this is for the activator gene and this is for the repressor gene and let me say i i hope uh, you pay close attention because this is uh, going to be a homework trying to generalize this to include uh, another loop of feedback. So what do we see here? We see that in the top, the activator gene, that it has three states. The, this is the state where just polymerase is bound, if you like. This is polymerase plus activator, and this is the repressed state. And you can see that there's a basal level of transcription in the absence of activator, and then there's a level of transcription in the presence of activator. 
I'm once again invoking uh, cooperativity, so, and that's intentional because we need the cooperativity to get the interesting re re results. And maybe I'll comment on that a little bit more later. Notice that uh, the statistical weight of this is for, this is, this is R squared, which tells us about the repressor gene binding to the activator gene. Now down here, this is the, uh, the, the states and weights for the repressor gene. And what you see is that the repressor gene is uh, ramped up to a rate R sub R in the presence of the activator, which you see down here. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to, as usual, we're going to write down some differential equations of the dynamics. So the first thing I'm observing here is that the activator is, uh, is degraded at a rate gamma. And then I'm going to note that there's production. And that production comes at rate that I show you here for basal production. And then there's a higher level of production, which is the activated production, which you see here. And So that's the, that's the differential equation for activator. And then we similarly can write down a differential equation for repressor. And that degrades at rate uh, gamma r. And then we have, in addition, an r0 r over 1 plus a over kd squared. And then plus r r. And that comes in at weight a over kd squared over 1 plus a over kd squared. So those are our two equations. That's That I did by basically by scratch and sniff. I, I exploited things we've already been doing for a while now in the course, which is we write down the states and weights. The states and weights tell us the probability of the different states. So let's look at the latter of these so that then we can see the diagram and the equation at once. So this is the state that produces at a rate r0 r and the probability of that state is given by 1 divided by the sum over both states which is this so the probability of being in that state is 1 over 1 plus a over kd squared so so basically what i'm doing is i'm i'm writing r0 r times p0 that's what i'm doing so we constantly are using the same idea, which is we have a rate, and then we multiply by the probability of being in the state that has that rate. And similarly, uh, the second one, the probability of the second state is this quantity, a over kd squared, divided by the sum over both states, which is the sum of these. So that's this bit. So those are our differential equations. Now, as before, we can explore this from the standpoint of the null clines. And you can see already that the null Klein for this equation, uh, uh, the repressor equation, let's look at it, uh, this one. So what we're doing is we're plotting <coughs> uh, R as a function of A. Okay. In other words, if I set this dr dt equal to zero, and what I'll get is that r is equal to r zero r over gamma, and then divided by this denominator plus this r r divided by gamma times this uh, this function, and that has this sigmoidal form that you see here. And then the other, uh, so you know, this is this is basically a on this axis, and this is r. The reason I have c tilde and c r is because these are in dimensionless form, and uh, I I didn't. Make the, I didn't render the equations dimensionless because um, that's something that, that now we did in the case, the case of the mutual repression switch, and I think you can, you can carry that out for yourselves as an exercise. So, uh, so that's the first equation. The second one um, is more complicated because you can see uh, that it features, you know, we want to solve for A as a function of R. Now that's messy, and I'm not going to do it explicitly, but that is what this null client is. 
And in fact, what happens is if we choose a given initial condition, then the system is going to move along this orbit, basically. So it's going to periodically move around in AR space. There is not a fixed point in this case, but instead there's a, there's a, a, a trajectory. And we can see that by, uh, by solving this equation, these two equations numerically, which is what you'll actually do in, in this week's homework. And the kind of outcome that you'll get is shown here, although it depends on a, on a reasonable choice of parameters. So what I'm saying, and, and let's look at this. So repressor initially goes up fast. When repress, or sorry, activator. Activator goes up fast. And as it goes up, it starts to activate repressor. So when repressor starts to go up, that starts to cause activator to plummet. But in the absence of activator, repressor goes down. So once repressor goes down, then activator comes up again, and so on. So, and we just repeat that again and again. And there's many deep questions to ask about this, such as what sets the time scale, how much energy does it cost to maintain, and so on and so forth. Um, what I wanted to, to say, and this is the essence of the homework that you're going to do, is that there's a paper from, uh, from the group of Jeff Hasty. Uh, this is in Nature, if I remember correctly, and I don't know, maybe 2010. I, I, this is one of those moments where um, not using my keynote slides is, is problematic, and I should have actually put a proper citation here, and I'm just I'm having a hard time trying to keep up with the class. So this is a very beautiful paper in which they looked at synthetic oscillators, and as you can see, they have the era C protein and LAC I, and era C is an activator, and LAC I is the repressor. And the one new feature here, relative to what I wrote down, is this. The repressor actually represses itself. And that's the novelty that you're going to include in your treatment of this example. In other words, when you do the homework, you will write down equations of dynamics that include this extra, uh, this extra form of feedback. So the lac I or the repressor gene will be both activated and repressed, just like the activator. So it'll be, uh, I can even, let me just foreshadow. Um, so, you know, this is basically showing you what you're gonna do in the homework. But here's my quote unquote solution to the homework problem. So, uh, so I the, at the top, I show you the diagram. And then um, the, on the, on the bot, first group on the bottom is the A gene, the activator gene, and that's its states and weights written in thermodynamic language rather than Hill functions. And the bottom is the R gene, and then these are the equations that come out of that. So, um, so the point is, is for you to actually numerically integrate these. What I'm saying here is that you can see that they built this thing, and on the right-hand side, you can see the very interesting oscillations with sort of a 30-minute time period. And they did very clever things, like they considered the, the impact of temperature, for example, on the period of oscillations. And they also looked at it as a function of IPTG concentration and so on. So it's a very interesting, nice paper. I recommend that you read it. In fact, in some sense, I would say it's required reading for the homework that you're going to do. Um, I, I also wanted to just, before finishing, comment on the repressor. So this is beautiful work from Michael Elowitz when he was with Stan Leibler, I think it's a grad student. And, and here, uh, that's using the architecture I showed you at the top, which is A represses B, B represses C, C represses A. And you can see that that thing actually, if you start with A high, then A is high, that means B is being repressed. And so B is no longer repressing C, so C will go up. As C goes up, it represses A. And now A starts to go down, but then that releases repression on B, so B starts to go up. When B goes up, it starts to repress C, so C now goes down, and that releases A again. So that leads you to these, uh, this nice cycle of oscillations. That's a very nice topic to think about, and, um, and there's many interesting papers that followed up. One in particular that you might want to look at is from Johan Paulson's group at Harvard, but other people have looked at these things as well. So this is, as I said before, this vignette was more in the spirit of knowing about than knowing, and your knowing will come from actually writing some code to integrate the equations of motion that we got out uh, by our sort of scratch and sniff approach. And you know, if you're looking for exercises, then you know, one thing to do is divide through by gamma and get this in dimensionless time variables, and then you could 
uh, write everything in terms of dimensionless KD. Uh, so there, you know, there's there's all sorts of interesting ways to to bring these equations into sort of a, more of a tidy format, which is useful actually, and I encourage that. So that, that's what I have on oscillators. I think for now, maybe if I get inspired later in the term, I will say something about the repressed later, or also think about stability analysis and that kind of thing.